Nobody knows how Kennedy died. Of course, we know he was shot, but we don't know how many times. We don't know from which direction. We don't know which wounds occurred first and second. We don't know which were entrances and which were exits. We don't know the angles through the body. We don't know what kind of ammunition damaged him, and we don't know which kind of weapons that ammunition was fired from. And that's what got me started with JFK Medical Betrayal. And it's pretty much like Johnny was saying, you know, this, this evidence is um, so messy, this is one of the reasons we don't know. And I've, I've given the talk um, several times now to, to different places, and I always say to people that what I'm going to tell you, I have documentary evidence for. I either have it published in a letter or I have an email, I have a diagram, I have something that will back up what I say in primary evidence. Um, and that's important, as, as you know, all of you have done some research, you know primary evidence is so important. And that's why my book is only 250 pages, it's got 750 citations in it. Um, I hope that you'll find it useful. So why did I decide to write a book? Why does anybody decide to write a book? And this is one of the things I came up against in publishing, is um, the publisher likes you to have a platform. What the hell is a platform? I didn't know what it was. A platform is your bona fide. It's why you are the right person to write this book. It's no good just saying, well, I've got the time. I've got the information. That's not enough. You have to have a background. You have to have some qualifications in the subject. You have to have done some research in the subject, had it printed preferably, preferably in a book. That's great. And you have to have done some kind of speaking. They have to know that you can market the information. You can market it for them as well. So it's not enough just to say, I've got the time and I, I think I know about this. What really got me started was the incorrect use of science in the whole case, not just the medical science. You will know the ballistics evidence, the physical evidence, the photographs, the films, everything has a problem with it. And I just didn't think that the scientists had given it enough focus. And not just government scientists, of course, all the focus has been by government scientists. But it needed to be looked at by some independent people. The medical evidence is particularly unsound. And it's, I know that one or two of you have already said to me, it's an avenue you don't go down because it's complex uh, and it's, it's difficult to get a handle on. And unless you have a bit of a background, it, it, it really is bewildering. It's, it's bewildering to me. I wondered why so many doctors seem to agree with the autopsy. And what really fired my imagination was this article by uh, Gary Aguilar and Kathy Cunningham, this um, five investigations. Uh, and you've probably all read it. I've read it many times. Um, and it hints at why the doctors all agree. I thought this was worth looking at more deeply. Um, and that's when you get a title on medical betrayal. I was particularly interested in the Clark panel and the Rockefeller panel and HSCA forensic pathology panels, none of which seems to have gathered a lot of focus. Of, of people have not looked at them very closely. Um, the Clark panel, I think uh, Harold Weisberg had a good go at And certainly I, I've referred to his book, um, Mortlera. Not Mortlera. Postmortem. Sorry. Postmortem. Yes. Yeah. Postmortem. Excellent. Uh, many, many times I read that. It's, it's falling apart and it's got all kinds of annotations in it. It's very good if you can get hold of it and you're interested in medical evidence. Um, I was interested in, in the particular, these doctors who were on these panels. What was the shape of their career? How did they interact? And I wondered how I might find out about how to do that. And I was concerned that the relationships between the doctors had driven their conclusion more than the actual medical evidence. And I think we've all suspected that, haven't we? But let's have the evidence for it. So my research really began, I guess, about five years ago. I was still working, um, but I had time. I had good internet access. I had time to start looking at each of the doctors that had been on these panels and looking at their careers and what they'd published. And then uh, about 2019, 
I had enough time between some contracts I was doing to actually start a library. Now I live in Cambridge, which is a fantastic resource for me. I get access to the Cambridge University Library. Of course you have to become a reader and sign up a lot of papers and stuff. But the medical library is at Addenbrooke's Hospital. It's the largest teaching hospital in Europe. It's a great library, man. And to have that resource just a bus ride away was fantastic. So I hit it. I kept going there and I kept looking up every paper from these doctors and some of them had hundreds of papers, they'd written hundreds of things for scientific journals. And I started to cross-reference them. Which papers had been co-authored by two doctors who were on either the same panel who had been on or, or two different panels and try, trying to build a picture of what their relationships might be. Because this is the key to it, it's relationships, it's not science. After that, when COVID happened and we all got locked down, this was a great point for me to actually begin focusing to write. And um, then I started to look at the various archives that I'd got access to. Um, all the Rockefeller stuff is in the Joe Ford, li Ford Library. So I contacted the archivist there, I got him to look it all up, I got him to tell me how many pages it was and bill me and hundreds of dollars. And um, I got all the stuff for the Rockefeller panel. I was very lucky to get in contact with one of um, Russell Fisher's granddaughters who was looking into Russell Fisher. She sent me hundreds of pages from his archive. Extremely lucky uh, contact. And um, then I started to look at the individual doctors where their archives had held, were held. They hadn't all got archives. Some of them had not gathered anything over their career, so there was no point in leaving it anywhere. But those that had, that I found their archives in the University of Iowa, I found them in various Texas university libraries. Um, and every one that I contacted, every one of those archivists were really helpful. And really, they, they're a real credit to the, their institutions. They not only photographed uh, or photocopied everything they had and sent it to me, they did it at minimum cost for me, which was very helpful. So I've got some, I've got some amazing stuff. I've got the slides of Ruby's autopsy. Oh, amazing stuff. Not particularly useful to me, but <coughs> useful to some of you. And of course the National Archives uh, in, in uh, Washington. Um, then, I, then I decided that really I needed to speak to some of these guys, the ones that were still alive. So I contacted Ben Wecht, who's um, Cyril Wecht's uh, son. And I said, you know, I'd really like to ask your dad some questions. I know he's getting on now. He was, he was 88 at the time. He's, he's 91 this year. Um, and he said, well, just call him. I said, what do you mean, just call him? Like, I can't just call him out of the blue. He said, yeah, call him. I'll tell him you're going to call. So I did. I called him. I recorded all the calls. And um, he was very cautious at first. But uh, it was, uh, you know, um, Mr. Kent and Dr. Wecht. And uh, we were very polite. And... By about the fifth or maybe the sixth call, it was my dear boy, you know, <laughs> which was very nice. And we were on first name terms, and I'd emailed him some things, and he'd emailed back. And he put me in touch with a bunch of other people. So he put me in touch with Robert Tannenbaum, who I've spoken to. Um, he put me in touch with um, Barden, Michael Barden, um, Vince DeMeyer, Henry Lee. So I contacted them all, I, I had phone conversations with them all, I had email exchanges with them, and managed to start to build this picture for the book. It's a, it's a lot of prep, you know, my wife would say to me, when are you going to start writing? You know, huh, at some point, I'll, have, I'll be ready. So um, let's just have a look at the autopsy to begin with then. Um, I think I might have one or two small things here that, that might be new to you. So, you know that it was performed in a lesser facility, and by that I mean the body really should have gone to Walter Reed. Um, Walter Reed was right next door, literally next door to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. That's where the body should have gone. That was where the expertise was. The war had only been over for a few years, and those people were in the Army Hospital. They would have seen more gunshot wounds than anybody else in the States. That was the right place to go. The Navy, there's, their, their people died of malaria. They didn't die of gunshot wounds. They had no expertise. In, in fact, Cyril uh, Wecht, Dr. Wecht, 
Uh, he told me that he didn't think that Humes or Boswell had ever done an autopsy on a gunshot wound with a victim. I couldn't prove that. I think they might have done one. Humes might have done one. Very interesting. Uh, of course, there's the thing about Humes doing the, uh, the one-week course in forensic pathology. Do you know why he remembered he'd done a one-week course ten years previously? Because it snowed. He didn't remember any of the content of the course. He remembered the weather. <laughs> So, um, I think the senior figures were appointed, they were chosen, so they, somebody said, let's get some senior guys who we can control through their pension pot and through their seniority and we'll make sure that they do what we, what we want them to do. Humes was definitely appointed because if you were told as the senior person in a, in a hospital that you're going to do this autopsy, you would appoint your best man for the president's autopsy, you wouldn't do it yourself. Because you know you're out of practice. You've been driving a desk for 10 years. You know that you're not the best person. You're going to appoint your best man. I'm convinced that Humes was told he was to do it. I don't have the evidence. Of course, that doesn't exist. The choice of Fink, though, is a real mystery. Now, I've been guilty of this, and maybe you've done this too. He's the one qualified forensic pathologist on the team. But let's, I, I started to have a close look at Fink, you know, let's have a good look at him. Nobody knows why he was chosen, because he was the head of the ballistics union at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Not enough. He'd been there for two years, almost three years. He'd been the head of this ballistics unit. He got a secretary. He drove a desk. He didn't snap on a glove every day to do an autopsy. He, he'd perhaps not done any autopsies at all in that period. I don't have the evidence for that, but there's a, good, there's a good case to be made for the fact that he was just reviewing other people's work. If you read the Warren Commission, it says that the, the most pertinent in, um, experience that he had was during the 50s, 1955 to 58, when he did 200 autopsies in Frankfurt. Now I thought about this, I thought, well, how many of those autopsies would have been on gunshot wound cases? Peacetime, in Frankfurt. And his, what's his population? His population is soldiers, their wives, and their children. So not all of those autopsies would have been on soldiers, for a start. Most of them would have been deaths due to illness. Very few of them would have been trauma, car crash, that kind of thing. Some of them might have been to do with accidental shooting. How many accidental shootings would there have been with a rifle? They would have been pistols, mostly. I bet he didn't do more than a handful of gunshot wound autopsies while he was in Frankfurt, which was, well, you can see, several years before he became a forensic pathologist. So none of the autopsies he did in Frankfurt were when he was qualified. That puts a new spin on it for me. Plus, he'd only been qualified for two years when he did the JFK one, and may never have done an autopsy in that time. So, for me, Fink went from being the most qualified person in there to, uh, he's just barely qualified to do it, you know? And certainly not experienced. There were m miles more experienced people available. Another case of appointing someone who's not the best. Which is weird. Fink then, uh, if, you, if you read some of the uh, ARRB testimony, Fink had a devil of a time getting into the hospital. The Marines wouldn't let him in. He didn't just arrive late, he arrived really late. He didn't arrive till quarter past nine. Quarter past nine. You know when the autopsy was supposed to have started with some preliminary stuff at eight o'clock. When Fink entered the room, snapped on his gloves, the body was eviscerated. That means all the organs had been taken out, Fink, fingers had been poked into wounds, and the brain was gone. So any opportunity that Fink had to look at the wounds, the, the guy who was qualified, it's gone. That stuff had been compromised terribly. All the, all the bones in the head had been sawn through. The brain was out in a bucket. All the, all the body cavity had all been all eviscerated. There weren't any organs left in it. You couldn't see where a bullet had gone. All the entries, exits, all changed. So Fink was in a really bad position here. You know, he'd got to say something, so he just went along with it. Of course, you know that the written record is terrible. The, 
There are some people who believe that there is a match between the photographs and the x-rays and the autopsy descriptions. I'm not one of them. They don't match. They simply don't match. You can't, you can't see an x-ray and say, well, you know, that looks like this photograph. So that's my point about the autopsy. And I, and I hope just a couple of little things there have sparked a bit of your interest. So then what I did is I, I went to look at each of the panels. Uh, I'm skipping a little bit here because in the book you'll find I went through the um, Royal Commission and I went through the Edward Arsenal doctors. And, um, but I thought we'd get on to the Clark panel because there's some uh, genuinely surprising stuff to me here. You, you have perhaps heard about the, the letter charade. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. that um, <laughs> well, we'll come on to it in a second. It's quite funny. Um, the doctors for the panel were apparently nominated. They were. Um, Fisher was appointed, I believe, but I couldn't find a paper trail for it. And I, I found that Fisher was the closest thing to a government forensic pathologist that I, that I could imagine. And let's start by talking about this letter. If you've read, if you've read Postmortem, you'll know about the letter. The first thing that Clark tried to do was make the idea of the panel seem spontaneous. Hey, I just got a letter from one of the uh, autopsy guys and he said, you know, we really ought to review it. And that's not what happened at all. What happened was Boswell was told, we want to do a panel. You think it's a good idea? Uh, we want this independent panel. Can you, can you help us out there? Uh, so a letter was produced, but Boswell didn't write it. This is the letter. You see the address there? It's not an address, is it? Where's it going to? Oh, you know, we'll, we'll just send it to Ramsey Clark, care of. It's like writing to Father Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, problem with the letter. No letterhead. Every, every doctor has a letterhead. Um, no proper postal address. No return address. Where's he going to write back to? And say, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll do this, come and help us out. Uh, no references. So in, in those days, when you get a typist to write your letter, they would typically put your initials on the letter and their initials on the letter and maybe a number to identify what, where it went in the file. That's none of that here. And uh, crucially, and, and Weisberg makes a lot of this, it's typed on a different size paper. I didn't know, because uh, I'm non American that uh, the government has different sized paper to um, everybody else. Who knew? I managed to get hold of another letter from Boswell. Guess what? It does have a header. It does have a return address. It does have a proper address for the person. It does have references on it. You can see that here. And I don't know whether this is artifact or not, but you can see it's a different shape. I thought that was a bit of a slam dunk. <laughs> Weisberg was right. What about this choice of the panellists then? This impartial choice of panellists. How did you do that? Well, this is really strange. In the book I say, why did, who decided that four academics should be chosen to nominate four doctors? Who decided that was a good idea? And which doctors did they nominate which were rejected? How many could they have? Nominated. Who decided four was enough? Nobody knows. There's no explanation. One of the people who was asked to nominate, apparently, was this guy, Sterling, Wallace Sterling, president of Stanford University. Now, he was made to appear to nominate uh, William Cummins, who was uh, the pathologist on the, on the panel, along with Russell Fisher. Cummins did have a faculty position at Stanford, so they may have crossed. They may have crossed um, paths. But Sterling wasn't a scientist, he was a historian. And he spent his whole life raising funds. He did nothing for science. He no, I, I couldn't find he had any interest in it. And how he could have judged who was the right pathologist to take part in the panel is a mystery. But the real, the real clincher is, I got to his archive, Sterling's archive. So guess what? I had to look to see if there was any letters between him and Clark and between him and Carnes, 
which there certainly would have been. Clark must have written to him saying, can you nominate somebody? He would have written back saying, sure, I'll give it some thought. There would have been another letter to Khan saying, hey, I'm going to nominate you, what do you think? There would have been, there's nothing in the archive. There's nothing in his archive. What does that mean? It means he didn't nominate Khan's. He didn't. It was, it was a kind of, what do you call that when um, you put your name to something? Um, it was a, an appeal to authority, if you like. What about the next guy? What about this guy? <coughs> Gordon, another one who nominated a panelist. He was asked to nominate a radiologist. This guy was an ambassador. He was a government man. Government man through and through. How he would have known any... Okay, he was at John Hopkins University. John Hopkins University, his enormous university. If he had crossed over with Russell Morgan, I doubt whether he would have known him. I doubt whether he would have given him the time of day. He doesn't have an archive, so I couldn't search it. But the fact that he's, he's so removed from the sort of person who'd ask to nominate a radiologist just made me begin to suspect more that these people actually didn't nominate anybody. What about the next one? John Hammer. <coughs> President of Michigan State University appeared to nominate Alan Moritz, a huge forensic pathologist. Um, Hannah, government man through and through, served in the administrations of Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, for that goes on, right? You couldn't get more government than this guy. I looked in his archive as well. He's got an archive, enormous archive. Not a single letter. Nothing to the DOJ, let alone Clark. Uh, Department of Justice, let alone Clark, let alone the person he was supposed to nominate, a professor at Harvard, Alan Morris. Nothing. So he didn't nominate anybody either. He brings us to the last one. Oscar B. Hunt Jr., I couldn't find a picture of him. He was the president of the College of American Pathologists at the time. Exactly the right person to ask. Yes, that's the right person to ask to nominate somebody. Um, but I couldn't find any evidence he actually did. No letters, nothing. I looked in Clark's archive, of course. No Ramsey Clark's archive. No, nothing. Nothing to any of these guys. This one is the only one that looks like it might be possible. But I don't think they were nominated at all. I think they chose Fisher. This is Russell Fisher. Now, don't get me wrong, this guy was a brilliant forensic pathologist. He taught most of the forensic pathologists that went, were around in the 70s and 80s. They went through his facilities. Um, and he, he did a lot of really good stuff as well. He, um, he did a lot of work on sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, we call it cop death. And um, he, was a good, he, he was a great guy. But he was a government guy. How do I know he was a government guy? I started to look at how he was funded. And he was funded from two sources. First source, Johns Hopkins University. Now, some of you may know Johns Hopkins University. It's a huge teaching university and a huge research university in the States. But it was involved in pure research, which means it's not industry. Uh, they, were, they were not being subsidized, subsidized by industry to develop products to sell. It was a government, um, a government university taking government money to do pure research. No one's going to invest in pure research except for that. And I found out that the medical school at the Johns Hopkins University was the biggest receiver of funds from the US government at that time, and still is, the biggest. Multi-millions going into it. Now, if you're, if you're a doctor or a professor in a department there, all of your money's coming from the government. How likely is it that you will go to go against a government finding? Very unlikely. That's one source. Second source, he's the Baltimore forensic pathologist. So all of his, all of his money comes from um, doing the work for the police, and doing the work for um, the university hospital. All of it was coming from either one government source through research or another government source through his work. He was the closest thing to a government forensic pathologist that you could find. So they appointed him, and Fisher chose the panel. He chose these three men, 
And why did he choose them? Two of them he knew from John Hopkins, and the other one was his old professor. It makes a hell of a lot more sense when you think that Fisher chose them than these other old guys who were ambassadors or they were yeah, in, in various government institutions for their whole life or were just raising money for Stanford University. This makes a lot more sense to me. Is it evidence? Kind of. I think it is. I think it's indicative. <coughs> Why did they need Fisher? Well, you, those of you who read about the Clark panel probably already are of the opinion that the whole idea of the Clark panel was to get, um, get the government's view more prevalent than Tim Thompson's view about the, um, the wounding in the, in the assassination. But everything that, um, actually Fisher was very clever. Uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, Fisher had decided that he was going to have to support the government, but he knew that there was something wrong here. This is my belief. And what he did was, he chose two passages, one from the Warren Commission and one from the um, JFK autopsy report, that he could support, and then wrote a report that did support those two passages. But he didn't support the whole thing, it just supported those two passages. I probably explained it better in my book. But um, he kind of set his own straw man up and then attacked him. Um, and his, his point of view on the the back of the head picture, these really poor pictures, was to try and get away from the Tink Thompson view that the, the head was in the wrong position. And he, this is a better one. So, this, you'll, you'll be familiar with this from a couple of books, where the, um, the head needs to be in a different position for the shot to be, to be correct. Why does it need to be in a different position for the shot to be correct? Well, this position, clearly someone shooting from above, JFK's got to be tying his shoelace for that to work. And, no, and nobody believes he was tying his shoelace at the time. So they had to get, they had to get him to raise his head up a bit. But this has several, several beneficial effects for the government. If you move the wound up, then the line of fragments in the skull looks a bit more likely. It's still not right, guys. No, it's miles away from the entrance wound. But it looks more likely. So that's a benefit. Second benefit, yeah, second benefit is you can have injury to the brain without injury to the cerebellum. Let me explain. This part of your head is all cerebrum, the large part of the brain. The cerebellum is about as big as your fist, maybe a bit smaller, and it's tucked underneath the cerebrum. And it's at the back here where your occipital bone is. If you get a wound in your occipital bone, you're going to expose the cerebellum. And indeed, you know that the guys in Parkland said that they saw cerebellum. The, um, the most senior guy, director of neurosurgery, neuro, uh, Ken Clark, he said that he saw cerebellum. I believe it. Um, but of course, this diagram shows no injury to the cerebellum. How do we solve that? We move the wound up. If it's not in the occipital, the occipital bone, and it's more in the parietal bone, less likely to get injury to your cerebellum. So the wounding, the position of the head's better, the line of fragments in the skull's better, and the lack of damage to the cerebellum. All accomplished by Fisher moving the wound up 10 centimetres. And by the way, in the book, I don't think it's moved up 10 centimetres anyway. I think it's a, the photograph shows it more or less where Hume said it was, around the sternal occipital protuberance in the sinus. That's the Clark panel. Are you writing questions now? Just in case. I might be going too fast, I don't know. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's talk about the Rockefeller panel then. Even less known about the Rockefeller panel, Weisberg didn't write about it. Um, and I got a lot of my information from the uh, Gerald R. Ford Library. Very useful. Um, it was run by former Warren Commission personnel, you know, uh, David Byrne. Um, there's no details about how the doctors were chosen, but I had a look at the doctors. I looked really closely at them. I looked at the research papers they'd written. McMeekin became the director of the Air Armed Forces Institute for 
uh, pathology, and you can't get more government than him. And uh, he was a friend of Fitz. Great. Off to a good start here. Olivia. Olivia had already pronounced for the Warren Commission as part of the Edward Arsenal doctors. He'd gone on, he'd sworn, you know, he'd given sworn testimony, so he's not going to go back on that. And he'd rerun the tests for CBS television. And of course he worked at a government institution. So the first two guys, government through and through, they're not likely to go against the government. Then you've got Spitz. Well, Spitz. I, um, I finally managed to get a copy of the book that he wrote with Fisher. It's just a huge book. Um, Co-author of Fisher. In awe of Fisher, in, in effect. Um, they all are. So he's not likely to go against anything Fisher said in the previous panel. And then you've got Hodges, uh, the radiologist. Um, he was subordinate to Morgan, who was on the Clark panel, and he shared facilities with Fisher. So these were either government guys or Fisher guys. So you're not going to get the Rockefeller panel changing the opinion of the previous panel. Not going to happen. And then I was really surprised that they, the investigation further compartmentalised this. And you were aware of this intelligence expression about compartmentalising, where, where you keep one part of an investigation strictly compartmentalised from another. And another way of doing it is by restricting the questions you ask. So they asked 14 questions. Ridiculous. I mean, we must have, between us, we must have thousands of questions. But they asked 14 questions. Um, and I got the questions and I got the answers. Each of the doctors wrote their answers. And there's some strange things about their letters. <coughs> it's book. The only then, having asked um, five diff four different doctors. Oh, I missed out Lindenberg. Good grief, Lindenberg. Let me come back to Lindenberg in a second. So they then asked these five doctors 14 questions and wrote seven pages, with none of the answers to those questions in the pages, entirely based on what those doctors thought of the Subaru film and why they had, had any more inkling into the Subaru film than, than we have. Certainly a lot less than we have, I would think. Um, ridiculous. Lindenberg. Oh my God, Lindenberg. Lindenberg was in the Luftwaffe during the war. He was a captain. <laughs> Um, he was a pathologist, he was the air district pathologist for Berlin during the war. And um, I've, I've contacted, the, I, I lived in Germany for six years, I was happy to speak of the Germans, so I contacted the German archives um, to try and chase up his war record. I couldn't find any. He's got a CIA file, found his CIA file. Um, he eventually was moved to the US as part of Operation Paperclip. Not that operation paperclip. If you don't know, it was um, a US program to bring um, Nazi scientists to the US where they could be useful. And he was one of them. He was a paperclip scientist. Um, so I had a real look at his career. He was mixed up with some guys who uh, went on to be charged, charged as war criminals. Um, there's a lot of uh, smoke there. there I, I couldn't find a lot, much fire because it's kind of tied down with CIA files. But um, there's more to say about Lindenberg if, if somebody who speaks better German than I do can get over to their archives and look up when he became a Nazi party member, um, which he was. Um, so I was pretty amazed about Lindenberg. And actually, a little aside, um, part of Lindenberg and war crimes trials is um, what's led me on to my, my next book. We can talk about Jimmy So let's talk about the HSCA panel. God. Largest chapter in the book. It took me ages to write this one. It's complicated. There's a lot of doctors. There's, um, I was saying to some of the guys at lunch that um, my editor complained about the number of names in the book. There are so many names um, and so many um, technical things that you have to get right. Um, but of course, I had Cyril Wett. What a resource, you know, on the end of a phone. I could just call him up and ask him questions, and I did ask him loads of questions. And I asked uh, Michael Barden a bunch of questions as well, and Tannenbaum, because Tannenbaum uh, was the one that um, appointed Michael Barden. He appointed Mark, Michael Barden because he knew him from New York. And he told me that I appointed Cyril Wecht, because, strictly because he didn't know him, but then he knew he was opposed to the Warren Commission point of view. Which I, I thought, 
Okay, kudos to Stan and that's a good thing to do. There's a really tangled web of associations between the doctors, um, and I'm not, the book goes into a lot of detail about it. I'm just going to give you an overview if you like. Um, there was lots of other dirty tricks in HSCA um, in the panel and in the, uh, in the printing of the reports. And if you've got copies of the report, you go and have a look at Cyril Weck's diagrams. They're printed so you can't read them. This is the tangled web. Uh, I tried to do it as a table. I'm a scientist, so you know, forgive me. But this is the best I could do. So uh, I'm going to look. I need to look myself because it is complex, right? So down the left, you can see the names of the HSCA forensic pathologists, and down the right, the state they came from. And if that's all the information you had, you might think, well, this looks like a pretty random selection of people, because right? they come from lots of different states. But the first column shows you uh, the book called Medical Legal Investigation of Death by Spitz and Fisher. Obviously, they're connected. And if there's a Y in that column, then that doctor also was connected with that book. He wrote a chapter in it. So that's four of them. Then there's another book, The Forensic Pathologist's Handbook for Pathologists. That was a DOJ book, a Department of Justice book. I've got two copies. Uh, it was written by Fisher and, Fisher and Petty and four people from the panel. Um, contributed to that. And then there's this one, this huge one, Monocle, um, sorry, Modern Legal, Medical, Psychological and Forensic Science by Curran McGarry and Petty. Petty was one of the forensic pathologists. It's a huge book and I held it up for um, Cyril Weck to see and he said he'd never seen it. And remarkably, five chapters in that one written by these guys. Are you seeing a pattern? Here? Are you seeing how they were connected? If you write a chapter in a book with somebody, you have to get, the, you have to get um, all the style correct, you have to do all the citations in the same way. You have to work quite closely together. You get to know people, you get to know the authors. I've written books and I've written scientific papers and I can tell you, you have to know each other quite well. <coughs> so I, I put another column in here in case, just to see, well, were they a co-author on a different paper, not one of those three books, but a, a scientific paper. Three hits on that. And were they a co-author with Fisher or worked in his facility? Four hits on that. The only person that's not got a hit here, who's the only person? Cyril. Cyril Wett. <laughs> Cyril Wett. Even Cyril was trained in Russell Fisher's facilities. He, he didn't really get to know Russell Fisher. He did know Lindenberg a little bit better. Um, so I confess that even Cyril Wett has a connection. But that was startling to me when I put that table together. And certainly, I think it's new information. Then I had to look at how did they work together? They worked together in a really strange way. The first thing they did in September 1977 was split the panel in half. We won't all look at the evidence together. We won't all interview the same people together. Ridiculous thing to do. Unless you look a little bit more deeply, what was the composition of the panel A and panel B? Well, Panel B had Cyril Wecht in it, and they kept him away from Humes and Boswell. He never did interview Humes and Boswell. He was there for the Fink interview. But um, Cyril still burns to this day about that. He's still furious about it. Um, so September 77, they spent about a week in the National Archive. It was three days, really. Um, because they were still doing their day jobs. They didn't, they didn't get a furlough. They didn't get told by the government, oh yeah, we know you get $400 a day for being a forensic pathologist. We want all of you, all, I don't know how many of them, nine, nine, we want you all to come to Washington DC, we'll pay your salaries, spend as long as you like. No, 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 no. They flew in on a Friday night, stayed for the weekend, and then flew home on a Sunday. Those that didn't live locally, of course. So it was a very much a part-time effort in their own time. And some of them, I... I I found some receipts that some of them had got for their, they've been paid some amount and they've got expenses. Cyril doesn't remember getting anything. <laughs> Poor guy. He's really put down. Um, so they did this first few days. Then they came back, what, six months later? Six months later. They got together for another three days um, and they talked to guys in the uh, photo panel and they, they questioned it was all the radiologists. And then they didn't do anything for another six months when Barden did his testimony. 
What was going on between those times? I wondered. That's what was going on. They were writing drafts. They were writing drafts. If you've read um, Weisberg's book, he pressures Fisher for drafts of the Clark Pound report. And Fisher keeps telling him to go away and eventually tells him that to sod off and he'll never talk to him again. Well, I managed to get drafts of all five, five drafts of the HSCA panel report. It's 128 pages each report. And so I spent a really laborious task looking through 528 reports to try and compare them. What had they changed their mind on? What had they missed out? What had they replaced? It revealed, quite startling to me, that at least half of the x-rays that they asked to be enhanced, and you know about the x-ray of the skull, and you know about the x-ray of the thorax that they, that they enhanced, and it's published in the HSCA volumes. There were lots more. They had them done, they didn't publish them. I couldn't get hold of them, sorry. But at least I know they were done. Why wouldn't they publish them? Why wouldn't they publish them? Because they didn't show the evidence that they wanted. That's why they didn't publish them. They deleted evidence if it didn't support the uh, single bullet theory. They reversed wor wording to make it more, less likely there was a more than one headshot. And there were other docs drawings. Who know there were, knew there were other docs drawings? I published in my book for the first time a docs drawing which you would never have seen before. So I thought I'd just give you a quick roundup. Am I okay for time? A quick roundup of how the um, how the forensic pathology panel report was modified. So um, here I've, I've got um, draft one suggested an enhancement of all these X-rays. So I know that they requested it, and I know two were done: the two skull X-rays. So those are the enhancements, and two other X-rays are published in the forensic pathology. Um, report. Uh, they're not enhanced though, so you can see they're a bit, bit crap on the But they did them, they did enhance them, they just didn't publish them. Weird. That's the first thing. Second thing, they changed things. This will be really familiar to you, right? Because exactly what the Warren Commission did, isn't it? Changed it from upper back to upper back and neck. So in, in one draft, it says that the wound was in the upper back. In the next draft, it says upper back and neck. Supports the single bullet theory better. No, nothing to do with, hey, which, which bone is it near? Let's, let's really be precise here. It's all about obscuring stuff. Deletions then. This whole part, these lines were deleted. This is important because what they're saying here is we can't judge where the entrance wound and the on the back and the, and the exit wound possibly in the front, which wasn't an exit wound. But we can't judge where they are on the body, so we can't reconstruct them on a mannequin. A mannequin. That's what they said in the report. We can't reconstruct it. And someone said to them, it's probably not a good thing to say, is it, guys? Because you know, we want to be a bit more sure than that. They just deleted it. Then they reversed stuff to protect this this, this single headshot, Cyril Wecht was always saying to them, he thought there was evidence of more than one gunshot. And so they said, the panel acknowledged that the residual defect might conceivably have been the location for an additional in-shot. Okay, so they're saying, it's possible, and given that possibility. In the published one, it says, they rejected that possibility. So you can see the skewing going on, and you would never know if you didn't have these drafts. There's, there's a lot more than this. I'm, I'm highlighting stuff. Um, then they, there's stuff that completely missed out. So there should have been a scale drawing of JFK's posterior thoracic wound. Note they say thoracic wound, which means it's in the upper back. Or if it was in the neck, it'd be a cervical wound. And a scale drawing depicting JFK's posterior thoracic wound, that would have been a, a drawing by docs. Not in the report. There's a lot more, incredibly. So, a computer-assisted enhancement of the neck. Now, if that had shown what they wanted it to show, which was some fracturing in the neck at the, you know, the, the, and the cervical vertebrae, which would be in the neck, where would that have been published? I'd have seen it on the cover, the cover of volume one. 
They didn't publish it because it didn't show that. I'm labouring this point, aren't I? There's a docs drawing you won't have seen before. <coughs> it's the docs drawing of, of that photograph. But they didn't publish it. Why didn't they publish it? Because everybody knows that that kind of wounding is not compatible with the back of the head drawing. It, it just doesn't look the same. So that, that drawing is in my book in colour. And I, I did this especially for um, Cyril Wett. He, he told me that um, John Nichols, Dr. John Nichols, and other friends of pathologists, had done a lot of um, testing with rifles, like, pretty much like Latimer did, but coming to a completely different conclusion. Um, and, and I said, well, I'd really like to speak to him. He said, my boy, he's been dead for 25 years. So I didn't get to speak to John Nichols. But I did find he had a whole appendix in the Forensic Pathology Panel report. So he just dumped. I dumped it out. Cyril didn't know that he'd written an appendix, and he didn't know that he'd removed it. He told me that he'd never seen a draft. They'd never passed a draft to him to look at. And so we come on to the, the, last, the last chance, really, I think, um, to really, because you know, a lot of these people are dead now last chance to really have spoken to anybody. There, there was no medical panel for the ARRB, as you probably know, um, but there were three experts. They did show three experts the material, some of the materials anyway. But remarkably, which you perhaps wouldn't have realised unless you'd read their reports, there's a full set of counter evidence. So um, these three doctors said that the, the x-rays didn't look right, the fragment in the, in the x-ray, you know, the, the 6.5 millimetre fragment wasn't right. They gave a full set of counter evidence, not published anywhere. Can't find it. Well, you can find it if you dig, but it's not generally available. Um, then they decided, well, we'll get, we'll get the, um, some of the autopsy photographs redone, enhanced by Kodak. This is what uh, What's the guy's name who wrote the um, Inside the ARRB? Horn. Thank you, Doug Horn. Um, I had a chance encounter with Doug Horn. I got into a taxi and into the airport in Dallas. And uh, I said, well, Doug Horn, aren't you? He said, yeah, who are you? Um, so I explained to him and he, and he told me that, yeah, he got, these, um, he got these photographs prepared. And what they did is they, they asked a couple of friends, uh, specialists to come and have a look at them, Dr. Henry Lee. He's not a forensic pathologist, but he's a forensic scientist, you know of him, I'm sure. And Vince DeMaio, who's very unwell, but a um, really sweet guy, uh, wrote, wrote a very nice um, email to me. Um, they asked them to have a look and see whether it was worth convening another panel. And basically, both Henry Lee and Vince DeMaio said, there's no point unless we're going to exhume the body. We <coughs> exhume the body. And, uh, of course, they're absolutely right. Um, and that's not likely to happen in, in the near future. I think we're there. Here, yeah. we're there. <laughs> so, I guess opportunity to ask any questions. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll, uh, you're concentrating on the clock panel. It's, it's the book, because I haven't read the book, obviously, not yet. Is it what Shame. mainly about it, the clock panel as such? No, it's, um, there's a chapter on each of the panels. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Oh, Russell, can you go back to the uh, picture of the back of Kennedy's head, the yeah. drawing by Dobbs? Well, that one. That no, the one earlier. Mm, going back. I'm not sure I've got the book. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's the photo. What is it, do you think that object just above his hairline is a set of wire? That one? Yeah. yeah. Is that a, a metal clip of some sort? Because it's put out in dog drawings to be just a blood clot or? Yeah. Who knows what it is? Because Hughes didn't know what it was. Yeah. My suspicion is that this was taken after Gaulers were reconstructing him, and that's part of all a bit the wax or something inside. Yeah. Well, let, let me just say, you know, the, the Fisher thing about this being the wound, um, 
you know, it's not very obviously a wound, and, and Humes thought it was a, a blood clot until he got onto the stand with um, the HSCA and then changed his mind. He changed it back pretty much immediately. But it looks very much like um, metallic rather than uh, blood clot. <laughs> these, these are all, I don't even know if they're Kennedy. Who knows? There's no identification on them. But I, I thought what was interesting is um, if you sort of draw a line from the top of the ear down here, this is not very high above the external occipital protuberance. I bet you that's not more than two centimetres on the photograph. And a lot of us have thought the occipital protuberance is down here because that's where they said the entrance was not. That's in the neck. This is where the occipital protuberance is. That's my opinion. Because the black and white version of that yes. is quite funny as well because yeah. there's a whole blackened pa patch yes. on the back of the photo. It almost looks like there's a straight line of masking present as such. It does. Um, and, and then, of course, Ida Dox's drawings and hands. Exactly. Barden asked her to do it. And if you've got the HSCA volumes, you'll find they did a sort of close-up of that, uh, that wound. Um, I think it's a wound in the back they've got a close up of. Um, but the actual, I, I got something from um, one, of the, one of the archives, which is a better drawing, simple. It's a better drawing than that, no. which gives a bit more depth. Right. Okay. Anyone else? I'm done. I've got copies of the book um, for during the break. <laughs> That's the commercial break over. Uh, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.